to talk about something that's a little bit more topical. Well, religious freedom is always topical, but this is a this is a topic that's been in the news a lot in the last few months. And if you've been following the news, the US Supreme Court just decided two really important cases on June 26th about same-sex marriage. And what I want to talk about first is why it's a controversial issue. Um, second, I want to give a little bit more history, just like I did yesterday, um, talking about what marriage has meant at different times and in different places. But if we start out with a quote from the Archbishop of York, this is when the government in uh, the UK, the, the, the coalition government, announced that it was going to introduce civil marriage for same-sex couples um, last year. And they'd had a long consultation beforehand and a lot of people had told them what they thought should go into the bill and what shouldn't be in the bill and whether there should be um, same-sex marriage at all. But the Archbishop of York said, the Church of England cannot support the proposal to enable all couples, regardless of their gender, to have a civil marriage ceremony. So he's not just objecting to religious same-sex marriage, he's objecting to civil same-sex marriage. And he goes on to say, such a move would alter the intrinsic nature of marriage as the union of a man and woman, as enshrined in human institutions throughout history. Marriage benefits society in many ways, not only by promoting mutuality and fidelity, mutuality, mutual um, obligations between the two spouses, and fidelity, that's faithfulness, right? So you're faithful to that person uh, and uh, over all others, but also by acknowledging an underlying biological complementarity, which for many includes the possibility of procreation. So what he's saying here is that there is an intrinsic nature of marriage that's been enshrined in human institutions throughout history. So the reading that I gave you today is a chapter from a book that's going to be coming out in October and December um, from Edinburgh University Press. And my co-author and I decided last year, we thought, you know, statements like that just don't somehow make sense. Um, it's okay to talk about religious marriage this way, but it doesn't really make sense, and it really doesn't make sense to talk about marriage as something that's been enshrined in human institutions throughout history, because marriage has changed a lot over history. Um, for hundreds and hundreds of years, polygamy was okay. Today, in many cultures, polygamy is okay. Now, you may have good policy reasons for not thinking that's a good idea. It may be oppressive for women. It may be bad for raising children. There may be all kinds of problems with it. But the fact is that people, as a positive matter, do marry multiple spouses sometimes. Men mostly marry multiple wives. Um, so one of the things we want to keep in mind in this whole discussion is what's the difference between a positive and a normative statement, okay? A positive statement is a statement of fact that's true or false, okay? It's a statement about the world. That's a positive statement or a descriptive statement. A normative or prescriptive statement is a statement about what ought to happen in the future. Okay? Banesh, who talked to the other day, is a political theorist. Political theorists spend their time figuring out how oughts work. Okay? That's what philosophers and political theorists and people like that do. Political scientists try to stick with what is, but then there are frequently implications from what is for what ought to be. So we're going to try to maintain this distinction today while I talk between positive and normative statements. Now, is this a positive or a normative statement? Well, to the extent that he's just saying the Church of England can't support a proposal, then he's just saying we're not going to be able to do this, and that's a positive statement of fact about what's going to happen in the future. They're not going to give political support to this. But then when he comes down here, he's also making 
positive statements about in, the intrinsic nature of marriage enshrined in human institutions throughout history. That statement is either true or false, and so we need to test it against evidence. And then finally, we start getting down here into normative statements about marriage benefits society. So marriage is good for society. It's a good thing. It promotes mutuality, which is a good thing. Fidelity is a good thing. And biological complementarity. If you think that's a good thing, then it, pro it promotes that as well. So let's just start out with kind of that statement in mind and take a look through some historical things that have happened in the past. We talked yesterday about the Reformation, right? Reformation took place 1500s roughly. Um, various countries in Northern Europe, England, uh, the Nordic countries separated from the church in Rome. Um, they thought that it, there was a perception that it was corrupt. Um, marriage changed at the time of the Reformation um, from being predominantly an individual promise between two people. So before the Reformation, Roman Catholic doctrine was that I could, if there was, suppose there was a woman named Jane here, and Scott's talking to Jane, I could stand here just with the two of us, nobody else around, and say, I, Scott, take you, Jane, to be my wife. And that was binding. That was called a promise in the present tense, and it was legally binding. Now, what do you suppose the problem is with that? Well, what if poor Jane thought she was married to me, and we had intimate relations, and so on and so forth, and then she couldn't prove that I was married to her, okay? So this leads to a lot of guys being able to take advantage of women in inappropriate ways. So the church starts to say, well, we think that it's a better idea, and this happens at the Council of Trent, but it's after the Reformation gets started. The, the, church, the Roman church says, we want to have a priest there at marriage ceremonies, especially before people sleep together. Okay, so, but it was a complicated pr procedure. There were a number of steps involved, but basically the promise in the present tense was binding. Now, there was another problem that came up in the 18th century, 1700s, okay? 1700s, a lot of people in England are making a lot of money, okay? And there's an old landed aristocracy, but people can't get into that aristocracy, so they're not, they don't have the amount of respect that they should have, and the aristocracy has even more money, okay? So that ha they, the aristocrats, nobles, the earls and dukes and people like that own a lot of the land, and so if somebody really wanted to move up in society, what do you suppose the best way to do that is? to marry into one of the aristocratic families, okay? Now, there was a place in London called the Fleet Prison, and outside the Fleet Prison, there were all kinds of clergy um, who would marry people, and they'd marry people who were of different classes. And frequently, it would be somebody who would get drunk and go out on a Saturday night and find some girl and get married, and sure enough, they'd turn up the next week and it would end up that some heir of a large fortune had married some woman who was way, way, way beneath his class. Well, this didn't make the family of the wealthy guy happy, okay, or the wealthy woman. This could happen either of the two ways, okay? So what happens is this guy here is Lord Hardwick, and he got very, very angry. And one of the things that made him particularly angry was that the registers of these marriages were frequently forged, so we're back to your proof problem, okay? So you'd get into a big fight about an inheritance or about whether somebody was married, and you'd have competing claims, and they'd all be relying on this unreliable evidence of these fleet marriage registers. So this guy, who's a decent lawyer and a good judge, says, I know what we need to do. We need to regularize this whole process of marriage. So the state steps in and says, we're going to have one kind of marriage only. That will be marriage in the Church of England. If you happen to be Roman Catholic, that's fine, but you have to be married in the Church of England. If you happen to be Baptist, that's fine, but you have to be married in the Church of England. The two groups that didn't have to be married in the Church of England were Quakers and Jews. Why do you suppose? Quakers and Jews don't marry other religions, okay? At this time, both Quakers and Jews practiced endogamy, okay? They were also fairly small groups, and they were fairly well organized, so they, could, they were both successful at going up to Parliament and saying, you know, leave us out of this. And they had both been, the Quakers especially, had been fairly successful at being obstreperous in the past. They refused to take off their hats to people and stuff like that. So they had been kind of social nonconformists. And so it was too much trouble 
to try to get them to go into the Church of England, first of all. Secondly, um, they were a small group, so it didn't matter that much. And third, best of all, they practice what's called endogamy. They only marry within their own group, okay? So the two exclusions from Lord Hardwick's act are Quakers and Jews. And guess what else? Lord Hardwick's act doesn't extend to Scotland. Why do you suppose? Well, there's a different church up there. Nobody could understand what was going on. Um, the, he drafted a bill, and it's in his papers, but it just never went anywhere at all. Okay? So we now have Scotland with the old rules. That means that you can get married by a promise in the present tense. And we have England with a new, very strict regime. What do you suppose started to happen? You'd go across the border to Gretna Green to be married. Yep. Okay. So again, we're back to this. When you do things in different ways in different countries, it can get complicated. That's the bottom line. Last point. Ireland. Intermarriage between Roman Catholics and Protestants was illegal. Okay. And a Roman Catholic priest who married a Protestant and a Catholic was subject to the death penalty. And at least one was put to death because he had done that. So... Uh, the, you've got a, we're back to this religious cleavage problem and where we define. So the basic rule that we're trying to get to here in our historical investigation is that it's really been the state that's defined who married who, especially after 1753. And it's been done based on certain cleavages, particularly religious ones or class ones, when Lord Hardwick was passing the 1753 law, there was a big debate in the House of Commons. And a lot of the people who opposed the 1753 law, this Lord Hardwick's act that gives the, the <coughs> Anglican Church a monopoly, a lot of the people who opposed that said that the state shouldn't be able to regulate religion. But it was pretty clear from the debate that the whole purpose of the law was to keep these rich people from marrying poor people. So marriage was intended at that time to reinforce economic divisions in the country. In Ireland, it's intended to reinforce um, religious divisions. Now we get to civil marriage, and suddenly this starts to fall apart. The state is still regulating marriage, but it's possible to marry in a number of different ways, even though it's carefully regulated. Um, civil marriage had been briefly available during the Commonwealth, um, and there had been some changes to the law back and forth about marriage. The Commonwealth, who remembers wh when the Commonwealth happened, roughly? We talked about it rough, just a little bit yesterday. The Wars of the Three Kingdoms, and Oliver Cromwell was in charge. They chopped off the head of Charles I, and so you have a period between Charles I and Charles II when England is a republic or a commonwealth. And during that time, there's civil marriage too. But they take it away at the end, and then they have to pass a new law that says that everybody who had a civil marriage during the Commonwealth was still married, okay, because they were worried that that would invalidate all those marriages that had taken place. And in 1836, finally, one of the things that happens is 1832, there's what's called the Great Reform Act, where the, uh, the franchise, the, the ability to vote, extends way out beyond what it had been before, so a lot more people could vote. And part of that campaign was about religious freedom and religious equality, because the nonconformists had largely been the ones who were excluded from the vote before 1832. 1836, we suddenly have civil marriage, so it's possible to get married without being in church at all. It's so the way that that was done was pretty unpleasant because there was what was called the poor law commissioners, and they met to make sure that people were um, to to make sure that people were getting support that they needed. It was an early form of welfare, but they also it was not a pleasant kind of welfare. And there was a workhouse, and they had an office in the workhouse, and they would meet there. And it was that office that you had to go to to have a civil marriage. Also, if you didn't want to get married in the Church of England and you wanted to have your Baptist or Methodist or Roman Catholic priest marry you, you, you couldn't just have the priest there. You had to have a civil registrar who came in and watched and kept the records because those clergy were seen as uneducated and not very uh, and, and, and transient. All right, finally, and this is key, divorce. Divorce was not available in, well, divorce was available in Scotland from the 1500s, but not England, okay? It isn't until 1857 that um, 
divorce is readily available in England, and it isn't available in Ireland until much later than that, the 20th century, late 20th century actually is when Ireland has it. I think Malta just recently started allowing divorce. So this varies a lot from state to state. Again, what do you suppose we get to? We get to this problem, just like Gretna Green. If you have, a div if you have divorce available in Scotland but not in England, what do you suppose people do? Well, they go to Scotland and get a divorce. What do you suppose happened to this poor couple, though, from Liverpool? They go up to Scotland, and they get a divorce, and they come back, and the husband remarries, and he's charged with bigamy. What's bigamy? Having two wives. Marrying a woman when you have another wife already living. They wouldn't recognize the Scottish divorce, okay? So he'd gone all the way to Scotland, gotten divorced, come back, gotten married, and they wouldn't recognize it here, and he ended up going, having to go to prison. You could get a divorce before 1857, but it was a very long, complicated process. You had to have a special act of parliament passed. And there, there, had to be, there were three parts to it. Basically, you had to be very, very wealthy. It cost thousands of pounds to get one. And it took three steps, and I'm not going to remember one of them. One of them was that you had to have a conviction of... It, only men could divorce their wives. Women couldn't divorce anybody. Secondly, you had to have proof that the woman had committed adultery. Okay, she'd had sex with somebody other than her husband. And then you had to have, so that was a civil suit that you brought based on that. And then once that civil suit had been successful, then you could have an act of parliament saying that you were divorced from. So, so there was divorce. I was oversimplifying a bit, but it wasn't easy. And, and Henry had gone through something like that process. I mean, he had to have a whole act of parliament and all kinds of stuff. So, okay, so we've got this problem again with having different laws in different countries, and divorce becomes available after 1857. Okay, so now we've got some history, and now we want to talk a little bit about the United States, just so we keep that in the mix as well. Um, in the United States, marriage is state law, not federal law, okay? So different states have different rules, for example, about two issues. One of the issues is how old you have to be in order to get married. And the second one is whether cousins can marry. Frequently states, some states allow first cousins to marry, other states don't allow first cousins to marry. Um, the old rule was that um, cousins were too closely related and people worried that they would have children who had birth defects and other genetic problems. Um, there is some biological evidence for that, but it's limited. Um, but the fact is that different states make different decisions about that. Um, but in the United States, there have been historically problems with race in marriage. So in the UK, you can think about class, economic class, and you can think about religion as the distinctions that are important when you're talking about marriage, the ways that the, the, the state deals with marriage. In the UK, sorry, in the US, it's been more about race, okay? And it's not just blacks and whites, although that is one big issue. It's also about Asians and whites on the West Coast because there were long periods of time when there were a lot of Asian laborers who came in particularly from China. And they would come in and for various religious reasons it was possible for them either to marry multiple people or to have different wives in different countries or whatever. And so those 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 individuals were seen as not being suitable for marrying whites. Um, Indians, were another, Native Americans, were another group that had some issues with intermarriage. If you were a woman and you married a white person, you became a citizen of the United States, which you were not otherwise. And there were all kinds of rights that you lost as a result of that. So Native Americans, Asians, and then African Americans. African Americans are the biggest issue of all. Most states had laws against intermarriage between African Americans and whites in the United States, particularly in the southern, southern United States. And it was not until 1967 that the U.S. Supreme Court said that those laws were unconstitutional, that people had a right to marry a person even if it was someone of, the, of a different race, okay? That case is really, really famous. It's called Lumming versus Virginia. Um, Mildred Jeter is the name of the woman, and I think it's Harold Loving, um, lived in Virginia, and they went to Washington, D.C., where it was possible for people of different races to marry. They got married in the District of Columbia and then returned to Virginia, 
And they were prosecuted under the, under the Virginia law that said it was illegal for African Americans to marry whites. <coughs> they were sentenced to 25 years in prison, but the sentence was suspended if they would move out of Virginia for 25 years. And they did move out of Virginia, but they uh, challenged that in court. They appealed. And the U.S. Supreme Court, in very, very broad language in 1967, said that people have the absolute right under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution to marry whomever they want to marry. Finally, I don't want to ignore the issue of polygamy and Mormonism because that's a really interesting issue and I think it's one that you need to think very, very carefully about. Um, in the 19th century, when the Mormon religion was being founded, the um, Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith had a number of revelations about how the world had been created and what people's destinies were and things like that. And his successor, Brigham Young, took a lot of people after they had been persecuted in the Midwest and they went on a long wagon train trip to Utah. And they founded Salt Lake City, Utah, and they engaged. But everyone in the United States thought that this was absolutely a nightmare. Everyone in, outside of Utah who wasn't a Mormon, they thought this was just absolutely reprehensible that these men were marrying multiple wives. It was, it was going back to primitive civilization. How could people do this in their country? And I think I mentioned yesterday, 1840s, Buchanan sends troops into Utah um, to say that, they should be, that this practice should be stamped out and they're unsuccessful. It's known as Buchanan's folly. But nevertheless, uh, over the next 60 years, they really did persecute the Mormons sufficiently that they gave up their ideal of polygamy. And there was a new revelation in the 1890s saying that it was no longer uh, allowed for men to have plural wives. And that revelation was necessary before Utah could become a state. The Mormons had to give up that or they wouldn't have been allowed to become a state. So all these things. Now, if we go back to thinking about the Archbishop of York's statement about the essence of marriage, it starts to look a lot less empirically accurate that there could be something like an essence of marriage once you think about all the ways that marriage has changed that we've just talked about. Divorce, once you've got divorce, it's problematic. I mean, all these things make it a lot more flexible concept than it would otherwise be. Nevertheless, he has a really good point in the sense that we don't want to force people to give up really important principles that they hold, okay? So he was saying there could be no civil same-sex marriage. That was probably overreach. But what we do want to be able to allow for is for people who are deeply and sincerely religious to say, I understand you guys are doing that, and actually I think you'll probably go to hell, but that's your business, okay? That's the way we do things in a liberal society. We say, okay, what can we talk about that we can agree on? What kinds of reasons can we give that will be acceptable to both sides? I'm not going to make you do things based on my say, religious beliefs, but at the same time, I expect you to respect my religious beliefs, not force me to engage in conduct that I find sinful or in some way unclean, all right? So one of the things that's really essential to understand is that sexual orientation, i.e. whether you're going to marry someone of the same gender or not, and religious belief are both important parts of people's identities. Okay? So let's start with these four reasons that I have for that. Both sexual orientation and religious belief involve an unchosen expression of identity. Okay? So people, it's generally believed at this point, I, I, there's still debate around the edges, but I think there, there is general agreement that sexual orientation is something that's not chosen. That's also true with religious belief. Usually you're born into a religion um, sometimes you are a convert, but usually it's something other than just a completely rational choice that you make. A conversion experience has to do with suddenly understanding something about the universe that you hadn't seen before. And for example, it's very unusual for someone to say, oh, I went through a rational process and decided not to be a Christian anymore. More frequently they'll say, I lost my faith, right? 
It's something that is kind of an involuntary thing. So both of these are not kind of rational decisions that people make. They're just something that, a way that they are, okay? Second, both of these two have a merged identity and conduct component, okay? The fact that I am a Christian means that I probably want to go to church. If we had a law that said you're free to believe whatever you want privately in your head, but we didn't allow people to gather in groups and worship, to observe dietary laws, to cover their heads if they're Muslim, to um, wear a skull cap, a kifa, if they're, um, if they're Jewish men. Those, those are all part of the religious ide identity, this kind of behavior. So there's a merged conduct and identity dimension. And that's true with sexual orientation, too. It's just odd to think that someone would be of a certain sexual orientation and would never have sex. It, they could be celibate, but the in the same way that uh, a heterosexual person could be celibate. But they're, they're, it's just odd to think about <coughs> taking those two pieces apart in both of those two <coughs> cases. Both are intensely relational, involving a partner, or in many cases, a higher being and recognition of the relationship in a community, OK? So all these things are things that you do with other people. Somehow you identify this way, and you identify this way along with others who understand how and who you are. And both create duties and responsibilities. As a Christian, if I'm a Christian, I have to obey certain rules about um, not working on Sunday, or at least not working too hard on Sunday. Um, I have to, again, probably have some duty about going to church, uh, giving to the poor, those kinds of things. Um, being in a relationship that's of the same sex, same kind of thing. There are duties and responsibilities that go with that. So both sides, the, the, the core of the argument here is that if people are going to argue about same-sex marriage, both sides have to understand that they, their position has serious, and serious similarities to the position on the other side. Okay, so if you believe in same-sex marriage, you have to understand that there are going to be people who really, really deeply, religiously, can't get how that would work. Okay? Now, let me just make one demographic point real quick. This is changing. Okay? When you start looking at the figures on who approves, who doesn't approve of same-sex marriage, um, there has been a really dramatic shift over the last 20, 25 years. And the changes in the percentage of people who approve of same-sex marriage come from two directions. One is generational, so that the probability that you, as a group, uh, don't disapprove of same-sex marriage is vastly greater than a group, say, of people over 60 the same group. If we had 41 people over 60 in this room, there would be a huge difference in the proportion who agreed and disagreed with same-sex marriage. The other thing that is changing rapidly is the fact that people, some people are changing their mind. And that is probably based, most importantly, on people who either A, have a relative, or B, a friend, or at least someone that they know very, fairly well who is uh, in a same-sex relationship. Okay, so as that has happened more and more, then people have said, well, all these people can't be that crazy. I thought they were, but they're not. So all this is changing, including the people who are deeply religious. A lot of people, increasingly, people who are religious are saying, well, okay, we're going to have to figure out a way to make those two reconcile. But the fact remains that there is a very substantial minority anymore um, who are religious and who really deeply disapprove of this. Okay, so when we're trying to sort a problem like this out, the best way to do it is to take some hard cases and figure out what the result should be. And all of these are actual, factual, real-world world cases, and I'll tell you about them. Lillian Liddell was a marriage registrar in the borough of Islington in London. And during Mrs. Thatcher's government in the 1980s, actually it might have even been John Major's government, but during the 18, 1980s or 90s, the, the British government passed a law that said that local council authorities, and particularly schools, were not allowed to promote homosexuality. Okay? So teachers weren't allowed to tell their classes that homosexuality was a good thing, 
and th th that was just the law. That was repealed um, under the Blair government. So, but Lillian Liddell was hired in the 1990s to be a marriage registrar when it was illegal for a local authority to promote homosexuality, much less same-sex marriage, which nobody ever thought would be possible. And she is a very devout Christian who refused to perform um, same-sex um, partnership ceremonies, civil partnership ceremonies. Um, for a period of time, they worked it out in the office so that she didn't have to do it. They, f they had other people who could do it, but there was a brouhaha over an equality policy, and some of the employees in the office felt that she was treating them like second-class citizens um, because they, they, they felt like she didn't have adequate respect for them, because, and they were gay and lesbian. And her, her conduct in refusing to perform these ceremonies was discriminatory. They um, brought an accusation in front of an arbitration panel, and they won. And she ended up losing her job with the Islington um, Council. So she was working for the government. That's one important fact about her. Um, I think it's really important that she'd been hired while, proposition, or while uh, Section 28 was in effect that forbade the local authority from promoting homosexuality. There was no way she could, when she was hired, have in anticipated that this might be a possibility. And certainly they were able to handle not having her do the same-sex partnerships um, before the people complained about it. All right, case two. This one's from New Mexico. Um, New Mexico doesn't have same-sex marriage, but they do have, um, they recognize same-sex marriages from other jurisdictions, and this couple, two women, decided they just wanted to have an unofficial partnership. It wasn't going to have any legal effect, but they wanted to have a ceremony with their friends. And Elaine Photography, E-L-A-N-E, -E, Photography, advertised in the telephone directory and, and said they would do wedding photographs. And this couple called up the lady and said, would you be willing to come and take pictures at our um, civil partnerships, at commitment ceremony, we'll call it. And she said, no, won't do it. I'm a committed Christian. I think what you're doing is sinful, and I'm not going to come take photographs of your, of your ceremony. The couple took her to the anti-discrimination um, authority in New Mexico, and again, they prevailed. She had, they said that she had unlawfully discriminated against these women based on their sexual orientation, and I don't think she had to pay damages, but she was told that she shouldn't do that again if she was going to continue to photograph weddings. She also had to do same-sex commitment ceremonies. Okay, Preddy and Hall versus Bull. Preddy and Hall are a couple. They had a civil partnership here in the UK, and they decide to trundle off to Wales for a weekend. They have a weekend vacation. And the Bulls run a bed and breakfast in Wales, and on the internet they say, we are committed Christians, and we hope that it will be okay with you, but we don't rent rooms with a double bed to anybody but married couples. You have to be married. And at that time, there wasn't same-sex marriage in the UK. And so they said, um, and then Mrs. Pre uh, Mrs. Bull usually mentioned it also when people called. But when Preddy called up to make their reservation, he called on the phone. He didn't look at the internet. And he, uh, Mrs. Bull was sick, and she forgot to tell him, oh, by the way, you have to be married before you can have a double room. So Preddy and his partner show up at the Bull's bed and breakfast one evening um, expecting to find a room, and sure enough, they won't rent them a double room, and Preddy and his partner have to go down the street to the police station where they find them a different bed and breakfast and they stay overnight. They bring uh, civil action in the courts and say we were discriminated against based on our s sexual orientation and based on the fact that we were in civil partnership instead of a marriage. And they get damages. They get actual money damages. It was, I think, 1,500 pounds or something. It was a fairly small amount, but they do get money damages. And the court found that the bulls were not allowed to discriminate against couples like that, even though they were Christians. Finally, and this one is kind of a fun one that I just found in the newspaper. There hasn't actually been litigation about this, but the, diocese, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Western Massachusetts was selling a conference center. And they, the reason, well, we won't go into that. 
the, they were selling a conference center, and this couple who was a married same-sex couple made an offer to buy it. And they, the deal fell apart. They, weren't, they didn't buy it. And unfortunately for the diocese, their lawyer inadvertently forwarded an email to the same-sex couple. And in the email, the diocese had said that the reason they weren't selling it to this couple was that they might have same-sex marriages on the premises after it had been sold. Okay? So the diocese, the Roman Catholic diocese, is afraid that if they sell this conference center, it will later be used for same-sex weddings, and they don't want to have that happen. Um, it was later sold to a different, um, different guy who announced publicly that he wouldn't have same-sex marriages on, on the premises. And I think the couple is at least thinking about suing over this, but that's, that, that will, the time will come. So these are our kind of four hard cases that we have to think about what kinds of rules we would use to decide. And in all of these cases, well, this one hasn't been litigated, but in the first, all three of the first three, um, it's the religious believer who loses, okay? They're not allowed to discriminate. Um, so let's now have three models that we can think about as ways of handling these kinds of conflicts where we have to decide between a religious believer and uh, a same-sex couple that wants to be married. And, and or is married. A minimalist approach to religious accommodation would at least say that religious organizations can refuse to perform or recognize same-sex marriages, okay? So for example, the Roman Catholic Church, it's pretty clear that it's going to be a long-term position of the church that same-sex marriage is not legitimate and that anybody who's married uh, to a same-sex partner is in some sense not acting cons consistently with Catholic doctrine. So at a minimum, Catholic clergy should not be forced to marry same-sex couples. That seems like that's just common sense. Secondly, they shouldn't have to recognize same-sex marriages for purposes of, say, if they organize a trip to Jerusalem, if the local parish organizes a trip to Jerusalem to visit the sites and there are different married couples going along and they don't want to have a same-sex uh, married couple treated as a married couple. They can be treated as friends but not a married couple. That all seems fairly basic, okay? Now, Robin Fretwell Wilson and Doug Laycock have responded to this minimalist proposal by saying that they think there should be more allowance for religious freedom. And their position is that as long as the same-sex couple isn't unduly inconvenienced, it should be okay to discriminate. So, for example, Preddy and Hall, who wanted the bed and breakfast, if there were a lot of bed and breakfasts right there in that same town in Wales, and that couple who ran, the bulls who ran the bed and breakfast, said, I'm sorry, we don't want you to stay in a double room in ours because you're not married and we, are, we really believe this. And these rooms are in our house and we just think that's sinful. But there's a place right down the street and they have an opening and you can go down there and that'll be okay. Okay? These guys think that that's the approach that should be taken. And they even, Robin Wilson has this thing she does where she talks about the registrar in the first example. And she gives an example of a registry office that does same-sex weddings. And it has four employees, faith, hope, charity, and efficiency, okay? And faith objects to same-sex marriage. And Wilson says that what she's really worried about is the same-sex couple who comes in and says, we want to get married not having to deal with the fact that somebody says, oh, I'm sorry, I can't deal with that. So what Wilson proposes is that out of those four, efficiency, who doesn't have a problem with same-sex marriage, is the re receptionist, okay? And when a same-sex couple comes in, she just naturally assigns them to either hope or charity, and so faith never has to deal with same-sex weddings. And that way, the same-sex couples never even know 
that they're being channeled in a particular direction. So they don't feel discriminated against. And Faith is allowed to keep her job, which also might be a fair response. Now, perfect, perfectly, let's, let's think through all the implications on both sides of this. On the one hand, that seems perfectly reasonable. On the other, these are government employees. And one of the really strong, fair points that's made frequently is if you have a government employee, they really shouldn't be able to discriminate, okay? Another point, another point you can make against this kind of an approach is the Bulls had that advertisement that said, we don't allow people who aren't married to have a double room. Well, doesn't that sound just a little bit like the old signs that they used to put in rooming houses that said no blacks or Irish, right? I'm willing to rent, but I won't rent to blacks or Irish. And if you're making a big point out of the discrimination like that, isn't that, isn't that possibly going to lead to other people saying, well, they discriminate, I can discriminate too, and so then you get more discrimination than you would have otherwise. Third, a lot of people have fought really, really hard for these anti-discrimination laws that include sexual orientation. And once you include a get-out clause like this, that really undermines those. So this is a really hard-fought debate about exactly how far these, things, these, these exceptions should extend. Finally, I think that the way to do it is to tinker. Okay, And I think that you can structure incentives in an intermediate way so that, for example, you allow for some of this kind of stuff, this, uh, you know, they can refer them down the street and that sort of thing, but you put pretty serious penalties if there is discrimination and inconvenience going on. So that if I'm in a same-sex um, relationship and I go to a bed and breakfast and the bulls think that there's a bed and breakfast down the street but there isn't one, and they send me on a wild goose chase and I end up having to spend the night on a park bench or something like that. I think the way to do that is to put a really hefty penalty in, in, in place so that the bulls are allowed to discriminate, but if I if I am if I'm the in the same sex couple if I'm one of the same sex couple, if I'm really injured, I really can recover something pretty hefty. That gives them a very strong incentive to make sure that I'm not discriminated against, that I'm not inconvenienced. I am going to be discriminated against no matter what if they're allowing for this stuff. So okay. So those are the three models. Now let me tell you briefly about the way that this has been handled in some of the recent developments in, here in the UK and in the US. Originally, the government just proposed to have civil marriage and not allow religious groups to marry same-sex couples. And guess what groups said, no, we want to be exempt from this rule? Quakers and Jews said, nope, we want to marry same-sex couples. Okay, we've decided on it. We had, they had a meeting. They thought about it long and hard, and they said, this is what we feel called to do. We're gonna so if you don't allow us to marry same-sex couples, you'll be engaging in religious discrimination. Okay? So, they said, so the government had to say, all right, we'll allow religious same-sex marriage. This created an enormous eruption from, guess which groups, the Church of England and the Roman Catholics, who really disagreed with the idea of allowing it. So the, church, the, the government came up last year with a, what they called a quadruple lock. And what they have decided is that um, religious groups can marry same-sex couples, but they don't have to. And before they can, they have to opt in. They have to make a decision as a religious organization that they're going to marry same-sex couples. And even if they decide that they're going to do that, individual clergy can decide not to. Even if they're told, uh, suppose that, okay, let's take a realistic example. The Reformed churches in this country are pretty close to being able to accept uh, same-sex marriage. But if the Reformed churches in this country agree to do same-sex marriages and tell their clergy to do same-sex marriages, the clergy will still have the right to say no. I'm not going to do that, okay? Um, and in addition to those rules, there's also a, a rule that says that no religious organization will be guilty of discrimination under the discrimination laws um, if they don't decide, if they don't want to do same-sex marriage. And they decided that 
the, and the Church of England has its own whole separate set of rules because they're an established church and so you have to have rules about how laws are made. Okay, so that's the quadruple law. Basically, the UK has followed model one up there at the top because there's no provision for the registrar and the government specifically rejected that during the debates on the bill. The government said, we're not going to allow registrars to opt out based on conscience. Now, in South Africa, they have a specific thing that says that registrars can opt out based on conscience. Okay, so that's not the only way to do that. But the government here decided they didn't want government employees saying that they didn't approve of same-sex marriage. They also offer no protection at all for any private businesses. So the bulls are out of luck. They're bed and breakfast. They have to, be, they have to rent to... Uh, they have to rent to same-sex married couples just the same as they do to other married couples. Um, wedding photographers aren't protected. Um, who was my fourth one? Uh, real estate transaction, definitely. There's no way. All right. Just to give you the other end of the spectrum, the state of New York in the last year has passed a law saying that they're going to allow same-sex marriage. They have extremely generous um, provisions for religious freedom, including a provision that says that a religious organization does not have to sell or rent property in a way that if, if it will be used in a way that's inconsistent with their religious beliefs. So the Diocese of Western Massachusetts would be protected by the state of New York's law, probably. Okay, so that's the other end of the spectrum. So all of this is about trying to figure out where to put this balance between religious freedom on the one hand and same-sex marriage on the other. And it's very difficult to do. You have to be, if, if you're being really serious and considering both of those sets of interests as having equal weight, then you have to come up with some fairly delicate ways of handling how the interests work. One last thing. Um, on the discrimination thing, it's worth remembering that the federal fair housing law in the United States um, prohibits people from discriminating in rental housing or sales, but rental housing is the most important thing, um, based on race. But in order to pass the Federal Fair Housing Act, they had to include what's known as the Mrs. Murphy exception. And the Mrs. Murphy exception says that if you, are a, if you own and live in a, an, say a small apartment building with fewer than five units, so you, you live in one unit and you rent four, you can discriminate based on race in the United States. So these little tiny carve-outs have always been part of this. And here's the really important fundamental government question that you need to ask yourself as you're thinking about these problems. Who do you want to make these decisions? Now, last month the US Supreme Court decided that the Defense of Marriage Act was unconstitutional, but they didn't make a decision about the law in California. In a lot of countries, courts, and in a lot of states in the United States, courts have decided that, um, that same-sex marriage has to be allowed. In other states, the legislature has done it. Now, when the legislature decides, you get much more generous provision for religious freedom because it's not just an up or down decision. So wh when, you're deci when you're thinking about this, think about what kind of institution should be making the decision about whether there's same-sex marriage. Do you want to have a lot of bargaining where you have the religious groups who can come in and say we want exemptions or do you want to just have a, a, a one-shot rule that decides the same rule for everybody? Connecticut in the United States is the only state where the judges made the decision but there are pretty generous um, religious exemptions. Okay. All right. Then I think we'll back to you. Let's go. Okay. To you.